All right. Let's get started. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say before we begin, and it's not on my announcement slide, but I was checking, and I don't know what happened, but I think the last couple of uploads to the YouTube playlist have failed or something, because, like, I uploaded them, but they're not showing up. I don't know why, but, uh, but I will check that uh, after class, and if I need to re-upload a few videos, I will. My apologies on that. Um, okay, I say here, I'm going to uh, I notice a little bit of a typo. I say here, attendance grades are posted. I did not post the grades from Monday. Um, it's advising season, so I've, I've, usually I'll take care of that like on Tuesdays, you know, if, you know, the day after the lecture. But I had back-to-back -back appointments on Tuesday. So I'll try and do play some catch-up and whatnot today. Um, my TAs are starting to catch up a little bit on grading. Uh, 5.1 is graded. 5.2 to 5.4, uh, they're still working on. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say, I know this is, uh, might sound silly, but make sure you're being cognizant of what assignment you're submitting to. We had a, a one student, or it was either one or two students, that submitted homework 5.2 on the 5.1, so it was kind of difficult to see. So just make sure you're submitting to the right one. I'll go ahead and say again that the exams are graded. Uh, what I'm going to do is during exam three, I'll probably just bring back all the ones that have yet to pick up their other exams and just sort of give them all at once. Um, but if you want your either your exam uh, your exam two or I think there's one or two of you that never got your exam one, you can stop by my office. All right, homework five point uh, five is due today, uh, and five point six. That's a typo. It's homework six point one because I wanted to say something about the homework. So yeah, that's six point one. Whoops. Um, so just so you all are aware, I'm assigning homework 6.1 today. We have homework 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, and 7, and that's it. So we are, we, like I said, I meant it when I uh, said we are, we are getting close to the end. I mean, we're on lecture 31, and uh, the, there's only 41 lectures in the class, and those include, you know, exam reviews, exams, our makeup day, which it looks like we aren't going to need the Friday before Thanksgiving break. There's not a whole lot of lectures left in statics. We really are sort of winding everything down, which is which is great. Um, uh, we've made very, very good progress this semester. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and jump into our one of our final topics of the semester, which is the idea of structural analysis. Um, and I, I sort of tinkered around with discussing this before, but I'll give you sort of a taste of what I'm talking about. So I have here uh, on the, uh, the little stage or elevated platform here a table, and I'm sitting here on this table, okay? Now, let's say this guy here doesn't like me very much, and he brings out either a lightsaber or a samurai sword, dependent upon whether you're a sci-fi fan or not, and he decides to take, which one? Lightsaber. Lightsaber, okay. He's an engineer. So he takes the lightsaber, and he cuts through the table right here. Okay, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to fall down, right? What's going to happen to his grade? There, there he goes. All right, don't worry. That, that, that's not happen. But now let, let's have a thought experiment and explain why that's the case. Okay? The reason that's the case is because right here, at that point in the structure that he decided to chop the table in half, he released from the structure the ability to withstand those forces. Okay? Right now, this table is in static equilibrium. Okay? And is it is in static equilibrium for a number of reasons. One of those reasons being the external forces required to keep the table in equilibrium. So we might be talking about the reaction forces between the table and the floor, or however much force these legs are holding up to keep me in equilibrium. The table's in equilibrium. But it's not just the external forces keeping the structure in equilibrium. It's the internal forces. Okay. This table has developed with, inside it internal forces that are keeping me in equilibrium. Internal forces in the x direction, internal forces in the y direction, internal moments, etc. And it is those internal forces that are especially important to me as an engineer. Why? Because if I understand those internal forces, then those are the decisions that help me determine, okay, how thick does this table need to be in order to safely support those loads? How uh, what's the diameter of this table leg uh, necessary to ensure that the, the system meets, you know, uh, uh, um, desired performance? And by golly gosh, gee, that's design, okay? That's one of the big tasks of an engineer is to design solutions to given problems. 
That's kind of how we do it, okay? Now, I'm giving you a solid mechanics context that we can talk about fluids or thermo or whatever context you want. It's the same concept. We determine the demand on the system and figure out how much we need to supply in order to ensure that that system's gonna function effectively and safely. And so in the land of statics, what we're talking about is the internal forces inside structures. That's what we're talking about, okay? Now, what we're gonna do in order to investigate this topic is we're gonna look at two classical examples of structural systems that engineers utilize. And the first are trusses, okay? Now, what is a truss, okay? Well, first off, these are some examples, okay? I gave you some civil engineering examples, my apologies to you mechanicals in the room, but there are very significant examples of mechanical engineering uh, trusses that you can find, and I'll actually talk about one here in a second. But in short, a truss is an arrangement of straight members, usually in triangular patterns, to form a structure or a component of a structure. Some very common examples in civil engineering land are bridges and roof systems. Okay, we see trusses all the time. Uh, if you go into the attic in your house, chances are there are wooden roof trusses there to support the, uh, the, the roof system. Okay, you see them in mechanical engineering contexts all the time. Go pull up uh, pictures of the International Space Station and you will see uh, certain uh, uh, structural arms that are supporting given components that are truss systems. Okay, now there are reasons why trusses are very advantageous structural systems, okay? One reason, and, and I'm gonna go a little bit outside the context of Engineering 213 because we're technically living in rigid body mechanics in this class, but uh, trusses are systems that are exceptionally stiff, okay? And what stiffness means is they have a very high force to displacement ratio. In other words, you can put a lot of force on a truss and they don't deform very much, okay? So they are very stiff. If you ever hear the term stiffness in relation to mechanics, that's what that means. It has a high resistance to displacement. The opposite of that would be a flexible structure, one that has very low resistance to displacement. We don't like flexible structures very often. We, more often than not, we want stiff structures. And trusses are very stiff. They're also very light, okay? When you compare them to their uh, other, I would say, counterparts, which are beams or frames, they are very light, okay? Um, now, one downside to a truss in the real world, they're expensive, okay? Trusses require a lot of members, a lot of cutting, a lot of welding, uh, a lot of fit up, uh, a lot of uh, uh, labor hours in order to fabricate the system. So they take a long time. That doesn't mean we don't use them. There are applications where we certainly need them, okay? Um, it's just you as an engineer need to be able to assess uh, a number of different solutions to find the one that's right for your given problem, okay? So now I wanna talk about analysis, okay? And I wanna talk about how we as structural engineers, and by structural engineers, I mean, I, I don't wanna uh, just live in the land of civil. I wanna talk about any engineer that's given a system and trying to assess the forces inside it. When we as the analysts analyze trusses, we do make a few inherent assumptions, okay? Some of those assumptions are actually even borne out by real life, okay? So um, the first assumption is that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints, okay? And what that's basically trying to say in a nutshell is that the forces that are on the system can be represented for the most part exclusively by what you're putting on your free body diagram. In other words, there's no unintended forces that come from contact between the uh, plate and the member or the members and the bolts or so on and so forth. The idea is that, that we don't really need to consider that. It's like the, the physicist saying, don't worry about air drag, you know, stuff like that, or air resistance. So it's kind of, kind of a similar to that, okay? The second assumption is that all of the loads, all of the support reactions are only applied at the joints, okay? So to show you a, a problem that we're gonna look at later, all the loads are applied here at the joints. They're not applied along the members, okay? We don't do that in, in truss analysis, or at least in the assumptions that we make when we assess a truss, okay? Now the third one, and this is the one that I said is usually borne out by real life, is that at each joint, the centroidal axes of each member coincides. And so what that means is, here's a, an image of a, uh, a, a gusset plate on a bridge, you know, out in the field. 
and we've got what one, two, three, four, five members. Okay, what the engineer has done is design this and it has been fabricated in such a way such that the centroids of all of these members coincide on a given point. Let me see if the pen will work here. So like as an example, like I would argue that the centroid of that member is probably about like right there, right in the middle, right? So that sort of goes, I don't know, like that. And then this centroid goes like that and so on and so forth. The idea is that all the centroids all meet at a singular point, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so the idea is that if all the centroids all meet at a common point and you are only applying load at the joints, okay, what that means is that we can assume that at the joints, and so if you take these two assumptions and you combine it with the fact that there's no friction or any other unattended forces to consider, what we're looking at is each joint as if it's a particle statics problem. In other words, there's no moment at each of the joints. If you remember in this class, the very first thing that we did is all we looked at were just a bunch of forces applied at a common point. So, like, if you remember, so the very first exam, the very first thing that we did, all we had were problems where here's a point, here's a bunch of forces going through that point. It wasn't until we had forces that were applied at different places along the structure that we started looking at moments, okay? So what that means is, is that at each joint, we don't need to consider moments, okay? That's, this is what basically these assumptions are all really baking down. Now, there are two methods for analyzing a truss. And by analyzing a truss, what that means is this. So here's a truss, we put some loads on it. I am interested not only in what are the support reactions required to keep the structure in equilibrium, but I'm interested in what are the internal forces inside each of these members. Like, what is the internal force inside member HI? What is the internal force inside member DI, uh, et cetera? Is that member being yanked on in tension or is it being pushed on in compression? Those are the, the, the elements I'm trying to determine, okay? And there are two methods that we ultimately utilize as engineers to analyze trust. The first is the method of joints, okay? So what the method of joints basically means is that once we determine our support reactions, we take each joint one at a time and we look at the static equilibrium of each joint one by one, okay? It is tedious, I will give you that, but it is also thorough. When it's all said and done, we get the internal forces inside every member. And those internal forces are advantageous to us as engineers this is the example with me sitting on the table. I need to know the internal forces inside of the table in order to size uh, this table. I need to know the internal forces inside these truss members in order to determine how large they need to be, okay? So that's what the method of joints is, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. Next lecture, we're gonna be looking at the method of sections. The method of sections is a little bit more like breaking out the samurai sword or lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, and actually cutting a section through the truss and writing equations of equilibrium for a given chunk of the truss, if you will, okay? The advantage of doing this is that we can solve for three unknowns at a time because uh, we have a third equation of equilibrium. We can now utilize some moments since we're looking at a whole component of the truss and not a joint by joint. Um, but the downside is that this method doesn't work very well to solve for the entire truss. It only works for checking a member here and there, okay? So, so yeah. Um, now, with the method of joints, again, so we're investigating each joint one by one and writing down the equations of equilibrium and solving for the unknowns, and then we just move from joint to joint, okay? Now, um, a couple things to keep in mind. If I look at this system, again, this is a particle statics problem. This is a concurrent force system. All the forces all meet at a common point, okay? So what that means is we only have two equations of equilibrium if we're considering 2D structures. We only have the sum of the forces in the X direction and the sum of the forces in the Y direction. So what that means for you as an analyst, and this is incredibly important, when you are using the method of joints, you can only solve joints where there are at most two unknowns, okay? And what I mean by that is to look at this example. So like, if, here's an example. Okay, what you do when you uh, perform the method of joints is you handle the, uh, the joints one at a time. You cannot start the problem looking at, let's say, joint D 
or joint B. Because like joint B has one, two, three, four members going through it. I don't have any way of solving that using just equations of equilibrium because I only have two equations. That'd be two equations, but I'd have four unknowns. It's got to match, okay? So what we're going to do for the rest of the lecture is we're going to look at solving this truss, okay? And we're going to solve this truss utilizing the method of joints, okay? Now, the first thing that we're going to do before we even look at solving the truss is we're going to uh, uh, solve for the reactions, and we need the reactions in order to uh, 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 perform our method of joints analysis. So we're going to compute the reactions first. Then we're going to get into the method of joints. So we'll start with something I think that's a little bit familiar. Then we'll get into the more unfamiliar, uh, I guess. Okay. Okay, so I'll give everybody a sec to jot this down and we'll go ahead and get started. So while you're jotting this down, let me see something. I might cheat a little bit. Oh, I already did. Never mind. I was checking to see if I had another image of the truss, but I already took care of that. It's like I thought I had or something. I'm usually bad at that. Now, while we're working on this, let's check these memory banks. How many unknown reactions are we going to find at support E? What type of reaction is support E? It's a roller. One, exactly right. How many unknown reactions are we going to find at joint C? Two, okay. Now, you've been down this uh, road before, so typically what we will do is we will assume a direction, and let me come up with some names for these. Let's call this E, Y. Call that C, Y. Call that C, X. Now, you tell me. This is just a reactions problem. You've done reactions problems before. What would be the easiest reaction to solve for right now? Say it again. CX, but, right? Because if I sum forces in the X direction, let's do that. If I sum forces in the X direction, what does that tell me? Tells me CX is zero. All right. Let me move my little truss here down. Make sure I got room. All right. Now, past that, we got a little bit of work to do. Okay. Now, how many unknowns do we have in the vertical direction? Two. So if I sum forces in the y direction, what I'm going to get is I got CY going up, I got EY going up, and I got 2,000, 1,000, I got 3,000 going down. So the only thing that's going to tell me is that CY plus EY has got to be 3,000. But it doesn't tell me what each of them are, right? It just tells me what their sum is, okay? So instead of summing forces in the y direction next, I figure what I should do is sum moments next, okay? Now, I'm going to sum moments. Now, when we sum moments, remember, we would like to sum moments to try and eliminate as many unknowns as possible, okay? So give me a place where we could sum moments that would be advantageous, that would be easy. C. If I sum moments at C, I eliminate CY, and all I'm doing is I'm solving for EY. Let's go ahead and do that. So we'll sum moments at C, take moments going this way to be positive, set that equal to zero. 
So we're summing moments at C. Let's start at the left, work our way over. Does that 2,000 pound force generate moment at C? You bet. Is it positive moment or negative moment? Positive. And what is the moment arm from C? 24 feet. So we have positive. Twenty-four feet. Okay. What about the ten? Uh, the one thousand pound. Does that generate moment at C? Positive or negative? And moment arm. There we go. What about E Y? Does that generate moment? Yes, positive or negative? Negative. And what is the moment arm? Six feet. Remember, the moment arm is the shortest distance from the line of action of E to point C. And so that shortest distance is just six feet. All right. Do I need to consider CX or CY? No. They, I'm summing moments at C, which means the moment arm is zero. It contributes no moment. So there's my expression. So 2,000 times 24, what is that? Um, 48,000. That's going to be foot pounds plus 12,000 foot pounds. Did I do that right, or is it another zero? Yeah, no, that's right. And I'll move that over. I'm doing this one in my head because my solution has some moments of E, so we're doing it live. <clears throat> so 48,000 plus 12,000, that's 60,000. And I get, therefore, Ten thousand pounds upwards. So far, so good. So now, the only thing left to do sum forces in the y direction. So what do I got? I got negative two thousand minus a thousand plus EY plus CY is zero, okay? Hold on, I got my sign, or my units. Now, So let's see, 2,000 and negative, or minus 2,000, minus 1,000, 3,000, negative 3,000 plus 10,000, that's 7,000. So I get 7,000 Uh-oh. We get CY is negative 7,000. That does not mean we need to develop significant emotional distress. That just means that in our initial problem, we assume that CY is going upwards. And if our direction is upward, but the magnitude is negative, it just means we flip the direction and it is in fact going downwards. So our actual reaction is down. Okay, do I have uh, any questions? Let me, I'll take a step and uh, back and make sure everybody's caught up. But hopefully 
this is not all that challenging. Are we good? Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is the new stuff. Now we're going to apply the method of joints. Okay. Now in order to apply the method of joints, here's my truss. Let's go ahead and Let's go ahead and put our reactions on here, right? So this one, uh, this one, let's go ahead and put that there. Okay. Now I'm going to walk you through the first one. Once you understand how to do this, I'll be honest, it does kind of get a little repetitive after a while, but that's a good thing. If by the end of this you're bored, but you understand it, then I've done something right. Okay. Now, the way this is going to work is we're going to go through and assess the equilibrium of each joint one at a time. But right now, to be crystal clear, we have no idea what the internal force inside any of these members are. We have no idea, okay? So remember, when you apply the method of joints, you start or you start assessing members that have at most two unknowns. So I cannot start here. I cannot start here. I cannot start here. I can either start at A or at C. Because A has one, two members going through it. C has one, two members going through it. Like I said, I'm going to help us get started with the first one. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's just go ahead and pick joint C. Okay. So let's start off by investigating the equilibrium of joint C. Okay. And so let me explain how I'm going to do that. So the first thing we need to do is we need to draw a free body diagram of joint C. So here's the joint. And how many members do I have going through that joint? I have one. And I have two. Okay. Now, one of the things I'm going to do for this member right here uh, is I'm going to write the slope ratio. Okay. And what I mean by the slope ratio, let me see if I can do a little bit better job at that. What I mean by the slope ratio is this is a diagonal member, and we go over 6, up 8. Okay? So we're going to go over 6, up 8. Does anybody know why that's advantageous? For us, in terms of math, if this is 6 and this is 8, what is the hypotenuse? 10. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle just scaled up. So 6, 8, 10. We're going to reference that here in a bit. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at joint C and I'm going to say, are there any forces that are applied to joint C that I, in fact, know? What are my knowns? And do I have one? Yes. I have 7,000 pounds going down. Okay. But now I have unknowns. Okay? I have two unknowns associated with each of these members. Okay? Remember, in trust analysis, we only assume, or we assume that each member only carries axial force along the axis of the member. So we're going to have a force maybe unknown like this and an unknown force maybe like that. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name these forces. So let's call this FBC. And let's call this FCE. 
Okay? So first off, where did the names come from? They came from the members. This is member BC. This is member CE. Okay? Now, what's most important is the direction. Here's the joint. Okay? Notice how I have the arrows pointing away from the joint. All right? If he's holding a bar, and I'm grabbing the bar, and I'm pulling it, I'm applying tension to the bar. Does that make sense? Okay. It is customary in trust analysis to initially assume all of your members are in tension. Okay? If you get a negative answer, it's the same story up here. Well, by golly gosh, G, it just means the element is in compression. That's all it means. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like dealing with uh, uh, angles if I can avoid it. What I mean by that is I'm now going to take this joint. I'm going to sort of redo it a little bit. Some of you are probably like, what is he doing? He's just drawing it all over again. Let me show you. I'm going to take this diagonal component here, and I'm going to split it into X and Y components. Okay? I'm going to name them as such. All right. Now, let's go back a ways. Look at this by itself as if it was a vector. If I were to write this in IJ notation, would the X component be positive or negative? Negative. Would the Y component be positive or negative? It's not a trick question, I promise. Negative. negative. I'm not trying to trick you. Okay. So the X and Y components would be negative. Now, if an X component is negative, what direction does that mean? Left. If a Y component is negative, what does that mean? Down. If I'm going to take this and split it into X and Y components being left and down. Okay? I'm telling you, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I've seen in method of joints is the wrong direction. Okay, let me move that over. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm now going to apply equations of equilibrium for this joint, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Make sure I'm not running out of time. Okay, I'm doing good. How many unknowns do I have in the x direction? How many unknowns do I have in the y direction? So why don't we deal with the y direction first? Okay. So I'm going to sum forces. In the y direction first. So I get negative. FCY minus 7,000 pounds is zero. I'm going to get the wrong sign on um, FCEY, aren't I? That's going to be wrong, isn't it? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, a couple of things. When we got a negative answer for this, that means our assumed direction was incorrect, right? So if I wanted to redraw the joint,
I would have to redraw that one upwards, right? But if I redraw, if that direction's incorrect, that one is two, okay? So that means that if I made a wrong assumption about FCE, that flips it, that means that goes up and that goes to the right. Make sense? So that means that both this and this need to flip. Okay, so that's my first point. My second point is that these two are dependent upon one another. If I know this one, I can immediately solve for this one. And how do I do that? The answer is my slope ratio. Okay, this goes back to the very first thing that we did when we looked at graphical vectors. Okay. I propose that FCEX is to 6 as FCEY is to 8. All I'm doing is trig. These are just sine-cosine relationships. That's all they are. Therefore, How difficult is it? Is that difficult? Does that make sense? Okay. What's left? What have I not figured out up here? FBC. What's my remaining tool? What have I not used? Summing forces in the X direction. Exactly right. I haven't done that yet. So now I'm going to sum forces in the x direction. So what do we got? Now remember, we're just looking at the joint, right? So I have negative F B C minus F C E X is zero. And notice how I haven't really changed the diagram I'm referencing. I'm just going to go ahead and keep with this diagram. And like for this term, I'm just going to plug in a negative value. So negative FBC. Hold on. Minus. So here, I'll carry it out. So that's going to be positive, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, it is customary at the very end to do sort of a summary. Because really what we care about in the land of truss analysis is what's the magnitude and whether it's in tension or compression. Now, we initially assumed that all of these members were in tension, okay? So FBC is 5250 pounds, and usually the way that we write that is we say tension. We just put a big T around it. Now... What about FCE, right? I mean, that's really what we care about. How do we find FCE? 
Well, we know FCEX and FCEY. How do we find FCE? The Pythagorean theorem. So, All right, and I'll go ahead and do that one for you. When you chug it out, you get um, 8750 pounds. And let's see if everybody's been paying attention. Is this member in tension or compression? Compression, because we assumed it was in tension, we kept getting negative answers for it. So the answer is compression. Boom. There's one joint solved. So now what do you do? You just do another one. And you just do another one and another one and another one until you got the whole thing done. Okay? Now, I want to start. We're not going to be able to do the whole truss here, but I want to start you on the next joint because starting the next joint, if you do that correctly, there is nothing else I can teach you about the method of joints because... It's all the same thing, okay? Now, I want to make sure we're clear on something. All right. Here's the truss. We just analyzed joint C. Now, what did the analysis of joint C tell us? It told us the force inside that member and inside that member. We actually figured it out, right? We got this is fifty two fifty pounds in tension. Eighty seven fifty pounds in compression. Typically, when you're done with a truss analysis, the answer is just this. Like you just write the forces on all the trusses and circle that and say that's your answer. It's all there. All right, let me ask you a question. Can we analyze joint B right now? No. How many unknowns are at joint B? Three. See how it was four, but now it's three? We know one of them. But could we go ahead and do joint E? Yes. Now we can analyze joint E because we know this one. All right. Setting up joint E, though, I really want everybody to pay attention to this because this is kind of important. So let's look at joint E. Okay. Here's the joint. There's the joint. We know the reaction. What was the reaction? Ten thousand pounds going up. Both of these are eight six. All right, now let's start writing our unknowns. All right, so this one, and again, we're going to assume their intention. That's FDE. Let's go ahead and be a little bit smart about this one. Split it up into X and Y components. Let's call this FBEY and FBEX. Now, if I am assuming that this is intention, 
which way should I draw the X arrow? If it's in tension. To the left. What about this? Up, right? Now, this one we know. So notice I got a little color scheme. I do my knowns in red and my unknowns in blue. Now this one is F, F, C, E, X, but we figured that out. I'm just going to write the magnitude. This one's uh, 7,000. I want everybody to get to this point, and I really want you to pay attention after that. because This is the most important thing I'm telling you. Do my little thought bubble over here. Watch this. Here's a bar. Explain to me how do I draw a member in tension? How do I do that? You have a pencil in your hand. How do you take that pencil and put it in tension? Okay. Go like that. Like that. Likewise, for a member in compression, do that. Equal, but opposite. I don't like that whole thing you start law thing. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Okay. Member CE, was it in compression or tension? Tell me, was it? I mean... Compression. So what that means is that you draw it in compression. See, so look. If you go over here, CEY was up, now it's down. CEX was to the right, now it's to the left. That is 100% correct. Because on the other end of the member, the force is going to be opposite. If you have a bar and I have a bar and we're yanking on it, you're pulling that way, I'm pulling this way. We are doing the same thing to the bar, but we are yanking in opposite directions. This force going up and this force going down, it's doing the same thing to the bar, just looking at it from the other side. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? So what do you do? You just keep on going. Write sum of forces in the y direction to get that, slope ratio to get that, sum of forces in the x direction to get that, Pythagorean theorem, move on to the next joint. Keep on going, move on to the next joint until you're done. That is the method of joints, okay? Does that make sense? I've given you some practice. This is work takes one minute. Let me know how it goes. I will see you on Friday.